Great, thanks uh, very much for the invitation. So um, what I would want to do in this set of lectures is to um, try to tell you about various uh, uh, perturbative approaches to trying to uh, predict uh, the clustering properties in, uh, in our universe. Um, but today I'll start by giving some motivation and also some summary of the cosmological model and uh, some of the open questions. I'll also try to um, review some results from linear theory so that we are uh, all on the same page with that. And then I will talk a little bit about some, some exact results. One of the things that I, will, uh, that I want to um, discuss in these lectures is the fact that as we move uh, um, in cosmology these days, some of the questions that we want to address are questions that uh, um, require both uh, measurements and computation and pr 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 predictions that are very, ha have to be very accurate. And so, um, I mean, not all of the questions as, as we will, I will discuss are in, in this nature, but a lot of them are becoming like that. So we need to make uh, predictions of fractions of a percent, uh, accurate to a fraction of a percent, measure things uh, that precisely in order to um, learn some of the things that, that, that we want uh, to figure out. And so, uh, we have to be careful. Are we, how do we know we are doing this correctly? What are the, and trying to understand everything at this level, it's more complicated. And so um, today, I'll, even though in the rest of the lectures, I'll also mainly discuss some uh, ways of doing these calculations analytically uh, using perturbation theory, um, I'll talk today a little bit about some exact results. Um, and, um, and of course, uh, the, the other, so the, the other uh, way of, uh, of um, dealing with these kind of questions is to run numerical simulations. And I think all of these, uh, all of these techniques uh, are complementary. And one should do everything to try to make sure that w one understands what's going on at the required uh, level of, uh, of precision. But uh, I will not discuss numerical simulations too much. Um, I, I, I will, uh, I will uh, present some results later in, in some later lecture comparing results to try to see um, how we're doing. Um, so let, let's start with the introduction. So I, I want to, um, I want to um, first go through the thermal history of the universe very quickly, so to set some scales and and uh, although you've already discussed the BAO and so on, just, just to point, point things out, uh, uh, because these, these things very much show up when we do calculate. I mean, in the real universe, either we use these uh, scales as tools or they are responsible for the fact that some of the nonlinear effects are, more, are bigger than others. It all depends on the relative sizes of these different scales. So, so let's go through the thermal history of the universe. So as you know, we live in the aftermath of some sort of Big Bang. We've uh, spent some time uh, um, um, figuring out this history of the universe. And by now, we have uh, you know, very, a, a very nice history of what happened at various times. Some, some moments we know very well what was happening 400,000 years after the Big Bang when recombination happened, uh, decoupling of the CMB and the, and the matter. We, we have beautiful pictures. We have nice pictures of how galaxies are distributed today or the Lyman Alpha Forest at Redshift 3. So there's various times which we know very much what's going on. Other times less so, like the formation of the first stars or baryogenesis. There are a bunch of things that we don't understand. So, but we have a very detailed, nice picture that hangs together uh, rather well, I would say. Um, and uh, so just to set some notation, uh, so we, we model this using a free, an FRW background. I will use tau as a conformal time. Uh, so I will, for the most part, talk about flat space. Uh, um, or a flat uh, spatial slice, the, 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 the um, uh, scale factor A, satisfy Friedman equation, um, and the, the way this A scales with time or with this conformal uh, time is it goes linearly with time in the radiation era, it goes quadratically with time in the, in the, in the matter era, okay? So this, and, and this tau is just related to time in the simple way like that. So th this, uh, so, and, and uh, furthermore, uh, last thing is, as you know, each of the components, rho, redshifts with the expansion of the universe, 
its energy density redshifts in a different way depending on the, on the pressure. So things, uh, when you solve this, um, or easily understood, if, if you take non-relativistic matter and you just dilute it, the energy density scales as 1 over A cubed, the uh, radiation 1 over A to the fourth, the cosmological constant is constant. Um, so, uh, and so then we've put together this uh, nice history. We have various things that happen at, at various times, as, as, I, as, I already, uh, as I already told you. Um, so, um, so the first thing that, uh, that, uh, to keep in mind is that as a result of this redshift, if you, uh, or this dilution of the different components in time, if you look at the composition of the universe, of course, at various times, it's different, okay? While today in our universe is mainly dominated by a cosmological constant, um, um, it was not so in the past, and you know, we, we have... Uh, uh, the CMB provides uh, nice uh, observations of the energy density uh, budget during uh, at recombination, which is the lower the lower plot, and uh, the cosmological constant uh, was not uh, particularly relevant at that time. Um, and um, and one thing to keep in mind that um, that. Uh, um, that 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 that. that uh, is relevant is that uh, this matter radiation, uh, so there, there's a, there's, as, I, as we will discuss, there's a, a particular point in the history of the universe in which their energy density in radiation and matter are comparable or equal, that's called matter radiation equality. That is not too different than the redshift of recombination. As you, as you can see here, photons plus neutrinos contribute a, you know, a, a sizable path part of the whole thing at recombination, while today radiation is kind of, doesn't even show up in this, uh, in this, uh, in this plot like this. So uh, the, the, this uh, is, a, is kind of a coincidence that, uh, that, that is interesting to keep in mind. Um, and uh, and so, so just to get um, a sense again, so uh, temperature in the history of the universe, either in Kelvin or in electron volts, uh, you know, this is just a bunch of power laws, so easy enough. Uh, so you have radiation dropping faster, matter dropping less slowly. There is this time where these two things cross, matter radiation equality. I've labeled here also when recombination happens from when we see the pictures of the CMB. And, and this is what I was telling you, that these two things are not too different. Okay, they more or less happen at the same time. And eventually, if you go, uh, if you go um, later on, eventually the cosmological constant, which is completely negligible at... Uh, recombination or at Big Bang nucleosynthesis, assuming it's a cosmological constant, which will I, uh, I will assume for, for my talk uh, and my life uh, in general. <laughs> um, it's, uh, so so it, only, it only kicks in rather late, and uh, you, you need to zoom in in this plot, okay? Um, so um, so that's, that's the thermal history. And just uh, to, um, to uh, bring, bring this... Uh, um, so the, the pictures from the CMB, they're coming from the redshift uh, of 1,000 when recombination happens to be. So what's happening is the temperature of the universe is dropping down. Before, uh, early times, hydrogen atoms were ionized, so you have protons and electrons. Eventually, the temperature drops below uh, the binding energy of the, of the hydrogen atom and the hydrogen recombines. In truth, you have to wait a little bit because so, the photon to baryon ratio is so high that uh, even when the temperature was, you know, half an EV, it's still pretty ionized because there's so many photons that it keeps ionizing the hydrogen anyway. But you wait sufficiently, it's an exponential, so you, you, in a little while it will, the, the number of photons will, will, will not be too high. And so what happens, so, if you, so this is the plot of the horizon, as a function of time, just the horizon in moving megaparsecs of the universe. And this is uh, the mean free path uh, for uh, CMB photons to scatter um, with uh, electrons through Thomson scattering. So if you plot the mean free path at the early in the history of the universe, this mean free path is very short compared to the horizon. So the, the photons are scattering very fast and they don't move very far. And you get to the time of recombination over here. So, so quickly, the hydrogen atoms uh, start uh, to recombine. You're losing electrons, so uh, you, you no longer can Thomson scatter. And so the mean free path starts going up quite dramatically. So this is a plot uh, as a function of time of the fraction of electrons that are free. So 
uh, it goes above one because of uh, the way this plot is made. Helium counts uh, as extra. So, so you start with uh, helium atoms recombining, and, and, but then at this, this last drop over here is when hydrogen, uh, when hydrogen recombines. That uh, corresponds to this time. It starts recombining. You start losing the electrons. Still, the mean free path is quite, uh, it's quite uh, short to start with that right before, uh, right before this time. So it takes a little while the universe has to become quite neutral for, for the mean free path of the photon to, be, to become larger than the horizon. That's what we call decoupling. And at that time, then the photons can just travel without scattering anymore and come to us. So when we take a picture of the CMB, the, the photons are coming from here, okay? So, and it's pretty, you know, the, the, this happens, uh, you know, it's rather fast, so th there's not that much difference between these two times, but okay, the two processes are slightly different. Um, and um, okay, so so when we take the pictures of the CMB, they 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 come they come from this time, um, and in the context of the in the context of a large scale structure, um, the 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 one, one interesting thing is, uh, uh, as you already heard from uh, from David, um, this Byron acoustic oscillation. So before so before, um, let's go back to the previous plot. Um, so before recombination, the mean free path for, of these uh, photons is very short. So you can think of the photons and the atoms as one single fluid moving together. It has a big, a big pressure, almost one third of uh, p is almost one third of rho. And so um, when you when you have um, when the the, the anisotropy is uh, imprinted, say from inflation, now. Uh, when they are inside the horizon, rather than being able to collapse and form some objects, pressure stops that and it launches these acoustic oscillations. Or, um, and, and these acoustic oscillations can travel in, in, uh, in, uh, in space. And uh, so if you imagine, uh, I think uh, David already showed you this movie, um, if you imagine one single over density somewhere, um, um, this, the, the, there will be some sort of spherical wave launch from there that can travel for the age of the universe at the speed of sound, okay? And that sets this 100 uh, megaparsec scale of the baryonic acoustic oscillation. So, um, so um, the, um, the scale of this peak has to do with the, how far uh, um, waves can travel in the age of the universe at, up to the time of recombination, okay? And, but uh, the co one thing to keep in mind then is the, the fact that, uh, that, um, um, that, that matter radiation equality is so close to recombination also means that this scale at which waves can travel, which is basically has to do with the, with the, um, 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 with, with the age of the universe at the time of recombination is not too different than the horizon at, at matter radiation equality, okay? So, uh, and so finally, uh, if you zoom in at the very end, you will find uh, the cosmological constant kicking in and uh, today the substantial part of the energy density being, uh, being uh, in the form of a cosmological constant. Okay, so, so that's the thermal history of the universe. So, but uh, for the most part in these lectures, I will be talking about uh, fluctuations and structure formation. So, um, so we have there, again, a basic picture of what's going on. Uh, gravitation and instability, that's what we are going to study, or we're going to, you've already discussed uh, in the previous lecture, but that's what I, I will discuss here. Gravitation and instability make small uh, differences at the very beginning, grow with time, and eventually form structure, and we want to understand how that took place. We have a in a sense, pictures of the initial conditions when we look at the CMB and you wait some time and you want to see, and we now know that uh, given the composition of the universe uh, as we think it is, there's enough time for things to, to form and, and, and lead to the structure that, uh, that we see today. Um, and, 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 and I want to discuss that in more detail in, in, in these lectures. But uh, the first, uh, I, I think, even though this is kind of tangential to, to my lectures, I think one thing that uh, it's important to keep in mind is that we now know, which we didn't know in the past, and I think this is perhaps for me is the biggest discovery of all, 
is the fact that these seeds for structure formation are actually not produced during this hot Big Bang phase of the, that I said we know very well, but they come from before, okay? So it, they come from before the hot Big Bang. Whatever came before, inflation, whatever, abracadabra string theory, whatever it was, um, left over something. We have observed that something. We are measuring very precisely. So we have our dinosaurs from before the hot Big Bang. And so the fact that we are lucky enough to be able to have this left over and be able to study it, I think is pretty remarkable. And uh, we didn't know this for a long time. And uh, it was the measurements of the cosmic microwave background, the acoustic peaks, uh, as uh, first seen, say, by Boomerang and Maxima kind of experiments, looking at those uh, acoustic peaks. Uh, that tells you that the, that the I mean, I, will, I, I, don't have to, I, I don't want to go to the details of how the argument goes. But, um, and eventually, you, we even have with the, with the polarization of the CMB a measurement of how things were moving at recombination, a measurement of velocity. So uh, it's very clear that these fluctuations, uh, I mean, it's almost a theorem that the fluctuations started uh, outside the horizon. Yes. Yeah, so, so um, I think, uh, okay, but we, we can go through argument as a function of time because it, it became very convincing around when the peaks were observed, but, but mainly by comparing with different models and so on. But if I had to give an argument now, I would say the following. Let, let's just take, um, imagine, so you, you're, you're looking at the CMB, uh, and uh, we know the size of the horizon there. So, um, you, you, you want to ask the question, um, when, I, when I look at the fluctuations that are comparable to the size of the horizon at that time, I see them. There are two possibilities. Either they are being formed exactly at that time, because that's the, or they were there from before. Okay? So there are two options. So let's say there's an overdensity here. It was there before, or something is forming it at that time. So very easily, if something is forming it, the material has to be going into that place at that time because you're, it wasn't, there was nothing there and the divergence of the flow needs to be that you are accumulating at that time, you're accumulating things there. Other option, if they were already there, there's an overdensity, more pressure, stuff is flowing out. So if I'm able to measure in the overdensities where the stuff is coming in or going out right at the scale of the horizon, then I know. Yeah. And so that's how we know because the polarization of the CMB is telling you exactly about the divergence of the velocity. So, um, so this is this plot uh, over here, this cross correlation between temperature and polarization of the CMB, which is basically um, telling you the sign. The, the polarization measures the divergence of the velocity. The temperature measures over density or under density. So this cross correlation is just whether in over density the divergence is porting in or out. Okay? And with this convention, whatever, uh, negative means over density flowing out. Okay? So we know. So I think I, 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 most people, including myself, were, and th this was measured for the first time. Uh, by WMAP, but I think this is why I said it's, a, it's kind of a theorem. So, uh, now, I think uh, most people, including myself, were convinced that, uh, that, uh, prob that this was not, the, 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 that they were there from before, even before this measurement, from the presence of the acoustic peaks. Um, but but that, that involved comparing these to examples of models where where you produce things during the hot Big Bang, like uh, uh, defect models in which they didn't have the peaks. It looked like nothing like the data, even when you started seeing this peak done. Okay? But, but at the time, um, uh, people like Neil Turok and so on said, okay, sh showed that, okay, for the, the form in which uh, um, uh, structure is being sourced by these cosmic defects, then yes, the, nothing like it. But if I just, uh, allow myself freedom to excite things as however I want, consistent with causality. Can I, can I produce something that looks like a peaks in a causal way? The answer is that in the temperature, you could. Yeah, so, yeah, it, but this sign you never get. So, so but, but anyway, long, long answer, I guess. Okay, so, um, so okay, we know the, we know the, uh, the history of the universe um, 
uh, you know, before I had uh, erased this uh, more speculative part from the, from the very beginning, now people add something, we even know what it is, it's cosmic inflation, it's already been proven, and, um, and um, uh, yeah, so you can skip this. <laughs> uh, anyhow, um, it's, in the, it's in this plot, okay, so this is in some press release, so it's true. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so, um, yeah, so, so we have some standard model, but in, in, the important thing to mention at this point for me, at least, is that we not, not, it's not just, uh, there's something left over, at least from a period of this. So we have some hope of figuring it out, not just by thinking about it, but by actually comparing this, those thoughts with actual measurements. Um, but uh, for, the, for the purpose of... Uh, of this talk, I will uh, mainly try to discuss things that are happening later after the CMB when, uh, when you go from these uh, very small fluctuations to eventually uh, more complicated uh, objects and structure as, as, time, as time goes by. So, um, okay, so that's uh, uh, the brief, uh, the brief uh, history of our universe and, and, uh, and uh, what uh, we know now. Um, the first thing, um, so I, I, I want to, at some, uh, to, to, to go into some open questions and things we want to learn more about, but before I just want to um, say that at zeroth order, um, what's going on is that things work extremely well, okay? So that's the zeroth order statement. So, uh, and I think, um, I, so I, I want to spend a little bit of time um, uh, talking about that. So, as we will discuss uh, later when we are talking about perturbations, we are going to solve how uh, you know, the structure form as a result of gravitational instability. So we'll end up solving uh, you know, some sort of equation for the gravity, some Poisson equation, some equation for the motion of some fluid. This is an example of a fluid with zero pressure. If you're trying to do the CMB and so on, there is some pressure term. Of course, in that case, this is also for a non-relativistic fluid, so you change it a little bit. But basically, uh, we have some simple set of, uh, of equations, dynamical equations tell us gr how gravity goes and how fluids move in the presence of this gravity, plus some stochastic initial conditions left over from before the Big Bang, okay, or the hot part of the Big Bang. So the sum of these two things allows you to calculate how structure forms and then compare with observations. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, it's just remarkable how well these things fit. I mean, I'm sure you've discussed this already with David probably. Um, um, the first uh, class, but I, I just want to flash a few examples just to, so this uh, plan 2015, you can, you know, look at these residuals, it's just incredible. Uh, the whole thing fits together incredibly well. Um, you can take this model and predict from it what you should see in other observables, and, you know, this is again from the, just a flashing of all plots, uh, uh, I mean, not all plots in the Planck papers because that will take forever, uh, but some random number of plots in the Planck papers uh, where you can see basically what's going on in these various different plots, different measures. There's always a line. The line is just the prediction from Planck temperature measurements for these other observables, and the points are other observables. And for the most part, everything goes through, okay? We can discuss some example of where things are not working, okay? And it's very interesting. But, you know, this was not how things were, okay? And so, uh, and I, I think it's just, uh, it's just amazing. That's the zeroth order, the zeroth order statement that, that we need to be very, yeah, surprised and uh, happy about how well this model has, has actually worked. Um, it's true, this model has some various components that we have, we don't have much more, much information about, but it still works very well. Um, okay, so now let, let's discuss some of the open, uh, the open questions that, 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 we, that we have in cosmology. So I, I, I'm here, I'll just pick, I'll, I'll pick a few random examples, okay? Um, because what I want to stress is uh, the separation between, or at least to give you a motivation to try to do these calculations of large scale structure more uh, accurately and so on, I want to stress the, the, the comparison between some of these questions that are very, as I was saying, require a lot of uh, detail, and, and some of them are not, are not like this. So I want to give you an example of these two types of questions. You, you I think, already have, uh, have uh, encountered them in these lectures. And, and, and. So 
the, the one that uh, you, you've heard uh, uh, about today is this uh, measurement of, so trying to constrain dark energy or the cosmological constant, um, and um, doing so by measuring the baryon acoustic oscillation. So these are examples of uh, the current status of, uh, of observations of, of distances measured in this way. Um, and just, just, to, um, just, just to illustrate that already today, measurements are at the percent level, okay? So some of them are better than others, but already we're trying to, we, we have measurements from this type of technique that means that, uh, uh, that, that we're trying to make measurements at the percent level. And so I think if you're a theorist working on this, you should uh, always strive such that whatever is the uncertainty in your calculation be 10 times smaller than the, than the you know, whatever people are measuring, so it's not a problem anymore. Your, 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 your how well you can calculate thing is not a, is not a factor in the, in, the, in the problem. So this means that already today you need to be able to compute things at the sub-percent level so that, you know, anything that you are not modeling is just a, a small correction that nobody really cares. Um, and, of course, this, again, from... Uh, from uh, uh, already David uh, showed you, um, if you imagine using this, uh, using this technique uh, to map larger parts of the universe in order to make much better constraints on the Hubble constant and angular diameter distance and function redshift, you end up seeing that you can make measurements at the sub-percent level, okay? And thus, theory needs to be better than this by a factor of several, so that's not to worry. So, so uh, I, this example of the example number one of something that is you, you need to compute in a detailed fashion uh, in order to, to 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 use the observations that are going to to become available. The other thing that we want to do in cosmology in the next uh, couple of years uh, in various different ways is to see if we can determine the masses of neutrinos. Uh, as you know from neutrino oscillation experiments, we have measured differences in mass of uh, the different neutrinos, the, 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 but, but, but we don't know the overall mass, okay? Cosmology is sensitive to, to this overall mass. In fact, it's only sensitive to the overall mass, the amount of, um, of, uh, of uh, density in, in neutrinos. Uh, we, we, that affects uh, the cosmological observables, so it's a, it's a good place to, it's a good probe to try to determine the the, the overall mass scale of, of, of the neutrinos, um, and we think uh, we can do it. Uh, and here's a plot of, uh, of the difference uh, between the linear power spectrum in the absence of any neutrino, so the sum of all neutrino masses is zero, and this is uh, different amounts of uh, some of the neutrinos. This is the minimum amount that can possibly be. Uh, given the, the neutrino oscillations for a normal hierarchy. So you can see that we are talking about, you know, percent level effects, okay? If we wanted to make sure that we are going to be able to measure this, um, if you're doing it at redshift zero, this, this part at, at k of around one is not uh, accessible to us because of nonlinearity. So we're talking about measuring it around here. So it's a percent type effects. We need to compute things also at this, better than this kind of precision in order to, to um, I mean, uh, in order to, to extract these uh, neutrino masses. So, so this is another example of, uh, of something that uh, we think we are going to try to get from large scale structure or lensing of the CMB and so on. And uh, it requires uh, significant uh, precision, okay? Yeah, I think, um, well, I, for, uh, it also depends very much on what we are discussing, because if we are discussing, um, um, say, clustering of galaxies, that's not something that can be done from first principles, I would think. I don't know if David is here and he would uh, comment on this, but if not, that's not something that the simulations are doing from first principle. In any case, it's some sort of hybrid. So that, it's some... Um, those are not first principle things. For other things that, well, in general, baryons are a small 
part of the thing, but it's not negli completely negligible. And you know, to what extent we can model them in the simulations, I think we really cannot, because uh, the, the, the simulations are not from first principles. Now, that doesn't mean um, that uh, they don't tell us anything, but I think um, you have to be careful. So, uh, but, um, but, but I think the, 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 the things like neutrinos or I think they're doable. I think it's not uh, so we should be able to do it with simulations or what, I mean, perhaps there will be some nuisance parameters in the modeling that you will have to fit to data. Uh, probably that's what will happen, and I think it's doable, but it's challenging. So I think, uh, well, but that, yeah, well, it depends for which probe, right? It depends for which probe. Uh, okay, so th then uh, an another another um, another place where um, where precision again is um, is. Uh, a lot of precision is required if, is if we want to, uh, as I was saying, we have these seeds from before the hot Big Bang, whoever created them. We are measuring them. We are characterizing them. We want to then understand this period of inflation or whatever came at that time. Uh, but again, we have measured certain properties of them, and I will discuss this, uh, uh, um, you know, in later more. But... Uh, so, for example, things that we, we, we know about these seeds, we have measured their amplitude, their change, their, their, how, how the amplitude depend, depends on scale, the slope. There's no gravitational waves, and so far at least, and no fluctuations in the composition, no departures from, from Gaussianity. These are all measurements that, for the most part, have come from the CMB. These are all statistical measurements. And they are basically, they're, the precision of these things is basically given by the square root of the number of measurements that you made. In this particular case, the square root of the number of pixels in the Planck map, which is kind of a million. So that's the reason why we, we, we can measure, say, these departures from Gaussianity to a part in 10 to the 3 or something like that. So um, the CMB has a lot of pixels. So anything that the CMB, so perhaps another way of... Uh, of saying this is that anything that to which the CMB is sensitive to and thus has been able to make a, a measurement with precision more or less one over the square root of the number of pixels, we now already know very well. And if we want to make any improvement on that, like things about the primordial seeds, we better be able to measure things even better than that. So these are all examples where you, you need a lot of precision, okay? Um, so you need to, if you want to, win over the CMB, you need to measure more numbers. So you need to measure, have surveys that measure more than a million things, OK? Signif let's say it goes like the square root. You want to do 10 times better than the CMB. You need at least 10 to the 8 things you have to measure, 10 to 8 numbers, so that the, the errors are 10 times better than the CMB, let's say. And then you are talking about constraining things to a part in 10 to the 4 or something like that. So you need to be able to co compute these things that precisely. Um, and as the universe evolves, things are more complicated than the later times. The CMB is all linear. Everything is easy. So it's more challenging. So these are three examples. And I think it's good because uh, you have a lot of time. You, you are young. You are you know, enthusiastic. You have, there you go. You know, people in particle physics com compute the various quantities. I don't know how many significant figures. They do it and they measure it. So that's what we need to do. So it's good that you are young. Uh, so, um, so, but let me just uh, spend a, a, a few minutes talking about other kind of questions that are not uh, so, um, so um, you know, that are not, it's not that everything in the history of the universe, uh, we, we, we need to know, um, we need to make measurements so precise, okay? So, for example, there are uh, the, the whole epoch of the formation of the first stars and galaxies and uh, Ionization, hydrogen recombines at redshift of 1,000, but is ionized today. So the, the, we say the hydrogen was reionized. This heated the gas. This has implications for the future of, of structure formation and galaxy formation. All of that stuff, we have pretty little idea about how it happened. And all of this is uncharted territory. We don't have very good observations. And so um, 
even qualitative things are going, are going to change our understanding. There, we don't need uh, measurements that are a tenth of a percent uh, to, to, to gain something, OK? Um, so for example, this is just, uh, so what people, th this is just some impress impressionistic uh, thing for you to see. But um, so, uh, so people are discussing how to, how to understand what was happening at the, this epoch of realization when the first uh, star turns on and uh, stars and galaxies. And uh, one potential way of observing this is using the 21 centimeter line of hydrogen. So these plots over here are various quantities Im important for these 21 centimeter measurements, either the power spectrum of the fluctuations or the mean brightness of the line and so on in different models. So it doesn't matter what the, I just copied so that you can see that people are, this, depending on what you assume, you're not getting a tenth of a percent difference, okay? The whole thing it can be completely different. There are peaks, no peaks. You know, here is a place where when people start making measurements, even the crude measurements will start telling us things that we don't know about a period of the history of the universe. It's not precision. I mean, it might be a very tough measurement, but it, it doesn't require, at the current time, super precise theory, okay? Because we don't know when this happened, how it happened, the masses of these halos were, you know, a lot of things we don't know. So, um, so, so, so clearly not all the questions in cosmology are, are, are precision kind of questions. And of course, the most important question of all, the most uh, profound question of all is, why are we, are we alone, okay? That guy, that is, you know, very much the most important question, I think. Very, I'm not joking. Sure. So how come we, they are not here? How is not they're colonizing the whole galaxy? This is very profound, okay? I don't know. Uh, and of course, you know, we don't need to weigh these aliens to three significant figures to make some progress. If something happened, if we see some signal, something, that's pretty dramatic, okay? So again, another question that does not require... Um, and, you know, there's something to finding these questions which we know nothing about because, uh, you know, if you, it's probably easier to make some progress for, uh, than, than something that... Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, I, I was getting for reasons that maybe become, uh, yeah, become uh, apparent later. I was getting a bit depressed talking with the Merdad and so on about these FNI constraints and so on. And Marco, and so I was saying, I think the best thing is not to do the experiment. Let's just ask. I mean, that's the chance. This is higher chance that I will know the answer to this than, than uh, if we try to make the measurements. But anyhow, I don't know why we're they are not here. I think it's an interesting question and uh, qualitative one. And uh, and in any case, um, okay, the intelligent life I have no idea. But of course, the big part of astronomy these days is at least uh, finding other worlds and, and characterizing solar systems and so on. And this is very much something that we were not able to do in the, I don't know, a few decades ago, and now it's a revolution, right? So um, I don't know where this will end up taking us, but it's, again, a very interesting, a, a very interesting thing that's happening now. So, uh, so, um, so the summary of this is there are plenty of open questions, dark matter, dark energy, neutrinos, etc. Some of the physical effects, especially things that the CMB is sensitive to, is really tough, okay? Because uh, um, the CMB has that had a lot of statistical power. It was, it, we were lucky enough that it's observable. You know, we could be living in, we are complaining about the dust uh, um, obscuring the CMB polarization or whatever. We, we could have lived in a galaxy filled with dust that we don't even see the CMB, okay? So it could have been much worse. Um, and, um, and so, okay, so uh, we, it was observable. We, could, we were able to map uh, millions of pixels and make great observations. And so we have some of the constraints that we have are very precise. Uh, the CMB is not sensitive to everything, so things to do with the dark energy cannot say very much. And so there it, you don't need uh, 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 8 measurements to make progress, but uh, in other questions you do. And then, of course, there's this completely open questions uh, that are even qualitative things uh, are, are, will be very important. Okay, so let's now uh, uh, start, um, start discussing uh, uh, linear theory, just a, a brief review of, of, of linear theory, just to get uh, all of these um, scales. Oh, there you go. Good. Um, I have until one, right? This is the, great. So, okay, so 
Good. So let, let me, so uh, uh, during, the, during these lectures, what I will uh, try to do is solve, uh, solve uh, equations of motion for fluids in the expanding universe. So as I was saying, there is going to be um, uh, 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 an equation for, for gravity, the Poisson equation. There is some equation for some fluid, in this case, some non-relativistic pressureless uh, fluid, some stochastic initial conditions. Another option uh, to solve uh, how matter is being distributed is to uh, cut it into little chunks, and it could be the particles of an n-body simulation, and follow particles, what they, how they move around. So the, then, it, rather than having the equations for a fluid, it would be the equations for the position of some particles. Q might be the label of the particle, T is the time. So we can use the label of the particle, the position of the particle at the initial time. So Q, might, you might think of it, you start with the universe with a uniform grid of particles at the locations, uh, the, the, the grids are given by Q. Uh, and then they move around, and then there is an acceleration equation equals the grad of the potential. You can, uh, if you know where all the particles are, you can calculate the density in an easy way like that. So these are two forms of... Uh, simple type of equations that we will try to solve um, with some stochastic initial conditions. Um, so let me, let, let's look at the, so, so the, the first thing to do is just to do the linear version of those equations. So, so uh, for example, let's take the example of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the equations for a bunch of particles. This is called Lagrangian perturbation theory, linear perturbation theory Lagrangian. So, um, so you have these. Let's uh, compute the divergence of S, um, and, uh, and so let's, let's uh, we, if we do that, we apply divergence to this equation, then we'll, we'll have a, and an, the, the, the good thing is that, um, well, okay, first of all, in terms of S, the way to calculate delta, I mean, this integral of the, over the delta function is just the determinant of the transformation between X and Q, okay, the, the SDQ, and so at linearized order, del, the over density is just the first uh, term in this determinant, which is the divergence of, 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 of S, so delta is just the divergence of S, so if we take divergence in this equation, we get an equation for the divergence of S, we have a Laplacian of phi, which is just delta from this equation, so we would have a nice equation for this divergence of S, which is just this one, okay, um, and then you can solve it, Interestingly, uh, things to point out about this is, uh, so this is just linear theory, then what you can see is that this equation has no spatial derivatives or anything, so it's just, a, so all the, whatever is the function psi, initial condition psi of Q, of the location Q, it will always remain the same, uh, multiplied by, you know, what you're solving is just the time dependence of, of uh, of that, and this time dependence usually is called, you, you plug it into here, you get D double dot plus H D dot, blah, blah, blah. You solve for that, um, and it's, uh, that's called the growth factor. D is called the growth factor, okay? So things to remember, in the, mat in the matter era, and this ha is the case in the matter era because there's no term with any kind of, derivative. there's no um, gr uh, pressure term that would give you a Laplacian of this kind. So there's no, nothing that, that uh, there's no spatial derivative, so it's very simple. Everything just stays the same and grows with some factor um, in the matter era. Um, and, uh, and so the size of perturbation just grows with time proportional to this growth factor, okay? And in the particular case of omega equals to 1, this is particularly simple. I leave to you as an exercise to check. The Hubble parameter in that case, this H tilde is... Uh, um, um, it goes like one over, one over A, delta is proportional to A, and the gravitational potential is constant. So you can see from here, H squared is proportional to one over A. So this is the normal Hubble parameter. This H, curly H, is because I'm using this conformal time. So the derivative in the H is with respect to the conformal time. But So uh, this thing is just the normal H squared times A squared, okay? And so that's why... Uh, uh, it goes as 1 over A as opposed to 1 over A cubed in the matter era. Okay. H is the density, Friedman equation, H square proportional to rho, and so in the matter era it would be proportional to 1 over A cubed, but because of this A square, that term is just 1 over A, um, and, uh, and uh, over density, in, if you solve this equation, you will find that delta grows like A, so the gravitational potential remains constant in time. So whole thing, just to 
uh, point that out. In the matter era, the gravitational potential will be constant in time. This is not the case in the, in the radiation era for the, for the simple reason that um, because of uh, the pressure, density, the over density in the, if you're in the radiation era, most of the energy density is in this radiation, okay? It will not grow, the over density will not grow, it will oscillate it will, because of the pressure. So it will just remain more or less of the same amplitude and just oscillating. But then it, when you solve the Poisson equation, there's something that doesn't change, and now the A squared one goes as one over A squared, so the potential just decays with time in the radiation era. So potential constant in the matter era, potential decays with time in the radiation era. What's the consequence of this? The consequence of this, now let's just... Uh, compute the power spectrum or plot the power spectrum of the gravitational potential in our universe today, in the matter era. So in, in these lectures, I will always use the convention for any quantity. The, um, uh, the power spectrum, I'll define it this way in the standard fashion. I'll al always define uh, some quantity delta, which is k cubed p of k. That is what you have to integrate in log k to get the variance of the fluctuations, and I will use the same notation for every quantity. So in part, this is the dimension, or the thing that has the, by multiplying by k cubed, this has the same dimensions of whatever your quantity was. So for example, for delta, this is just dimensionless, okay? Um, so now I'm plotting this, uh, I'm plotting this uh, delta thing, but for the gravitational potential in our universe today, and you will see on large scales, it's just a constant, if the universe was scale invariant, the initial conditions from, from inflation, apart from the small tilt, and the universe had always been in the matter era, this would just be a constant, the whole thing for every, for every k. But you can see that on, on small scales, on large k, the amplitude of the gravitational potential is suff it's suppressed with respect to that constant. What is, why is that? It's because modes that enter the horizon during the radiation era, the, the, the potential decayed with time, and so these are modes, these are mo this line denotes the modes that enter the horizon before or after the radiation era. If they enter after, for them, if the universe was always matter dominated, the potential is constant, but for these guys, during some time, the universe was radiation dominated and the potential decays, okay? And this, this decay, the fact that it's, it's, it's a larger suppression for higher k is just because they were inside the horizon for a longer period during the radiation era, the modes that are smaller, okay? So very important then this transition of matter radiation equality is important. It sets a scale into the, into the power spectrum in our universe, okay? Now if I plot the same quantity delta but for the density fluctuations, remember that from the Poisson equation, phi and delta have a k square so this gets multiplied by those factors, and so it goes, it goes um, you know, it always goes up, it doesn't decay like that, but uh, you can see that it's not a power law. It bends, and the place where it bends is because of this matter radiation. Uh, so if the universe was always matter dominated, it would be a power law like that, but it, you know, the fact that it bends is, is, from, is from that, okay? Um, similar, pro now I've, similar plot, but I've plotted now the power spectrum rather than kq, p of k. The other thing to notice there is these little wiggles there. Um, these are the BAO wiggles that you already discussed. In this kind of plot, they're tiny, okay? And the reason they're tiny is because uh, the baryons are only a small, which was what was in this baryon acoustic oscillation is just a small fraction of the total matter. Um, so the next... Um, the next thing that I want to discuss, which is important, is the power spectrum for this displacement. So I already told you that, uh, so if I take some particles, I can think of them that they started at position Q, and, I move, and they move by some amount. Uh, well, okay, let me just do like that. Okay, so I want to know, uh, I want to know the, the sizes and, and the power spectrum of that displacement, how things moved, okay? And I already told you that at least in linear theory, uh, the overdensity is just given by the determinant, or one plus delta is just given by the determinant of the transformation between Q, and because in these Q variables, everything was initially uh, uniform, so the overdensity has to do just with the, the, the determinant of the tr uh, dx dq or the ds dq, and so delta is just given by the divergence of S, okay? 
So if I want to do the power spectrum of S, I need to divide the power spectrum of delta by a K, okay, by a wave vector. Okay, so in Fourier space, delta is K times S. Okay? So if I want to do the power spectrum of the displacement, um, it will be the same as the power spectrum of the density, but divided by K squared. Okay? So I'm plotting just there, here, uh, this here. For you to, uh, re so now again, you can see now in, in, for this particular quantity, there's a peak to it. Okay? And the peak has to do with the matter radiation equality, is where it turns, the power spectrum turns around. Okay? So if you're talking about the displacements, the biggest displacements are produced by modes around this range of scales. It, it, you know, it's kind of flat here for a while, so all the modes in all of these range of scales produce most of the displacements, okay? And uh, so that's important to keep in mind, okay? Because as, as we will see, some of these, non not all the nonlinear effect depends on the same things. Some of them depend on delta, some of them depend on the displacement as we go along. And so it's important to, figure, to remember what, what modes, what scales are producing what, and in particular, if it's any kind of nonlinear effect to do with the displacement, know that, uh, so um, if we are talking about the density, k cubed p of k, the smaller the scale, the higher the k, the bigger the delta, okay? So if, if it's a nonlinear effect proportional to delta, well, the, the, the higher the k, the bigger the thing, the, the, the bigger effect it will make. If it's a nonlinear effect uh, to do with the displacement, the thing is not like that. When you go to high k, it's the lower k's that do more, more. So if you're somewhere here, this guy does less of damage than somebody over there, okay? So this matter radiation equality has some implications. It will have some implications. Not every uh, nonlinear effect is the same, okay? Um, the, the other thing that... Um, that um, to, to keep in mind is this BAO wiggles. What I did here is uh, I just took the power spectrum of the, that, that I showed before, the one that looked uh, like that, and it had the BAO wiggles here that you're barely noticeable. I just subtracted out the part that uh, looks like a smooth without the wiggles, and I'm plotting just the wiggles, okay? So the power spectrum is just a smooth curve, with, on, and on top of it are these wiggles, uh, and I'm plotting them just for you to, for comparison of the scales, okay? So these BAO wiggles, that's where they are. These are the scales where they are. This is the plot of this transfer function so that you see matter radiation equality when the transfer function is uh, dropping. And you can see this fact that the, the scales are not so different. The things that happen to happen at the same wave number, coincidence related to the fact that matter radiation equality and the sound horizon at recombination are not too different. Okay? Equivalently here, I plotted the BAO wiggles and this power spectrum of the displacement that I plotted before that had this peak at matter. Uh, now it's not a log log plot. That's why it looks a little bit different. But you can see that, again, similar, similar scales. Okay? Um, finally, in the correlation function, we already discussed uh, um, the correlation function with David. Uh, if you just Fourier transform uh, the, the, um, the power spectrum, there is this bump the, in the, the BAO wiggle. Uh, and uh, here you can see, so I, I wanted to, um, to show this in, uh, to, to point two things, okay? Uh, first of all, that while in the, while if I go, I mean, these are all kind of, but ju just to, to I, I go to a power, uh, something in the power spectrum, the BAO wiggles, you have to, Look for them, okay? It, it looks like little thingies, okay, over there. Um, in, the power sp in the correlation function, it very much, first of all, instead of being many wiggles, it's just one thing. Uh, and it's making a big correction to the, what the, so this, this yellow line is what the correlation function would be like the correlation function corresponding to the smooth curve I had subtracted before, okay? So you can think of the power spectrum as the sum of two things, a smooth part and the wiggles. So the dark curve there is the full correlation function. The yellow thingy is the correlation function of the case with no baryon acoustic oscillation. So the baryon acoustic oscillation are making a, a, a very big difference uh, at this scale. So that's uh, 
one of the reasons people try to, uh, usually when they do the measurements, they talk about it in this space because it, you know, the, all of the wiggles, they combine to just one thingy and it's a big effect compared to what things would have been without it, okay? And part of the fact that it's a big effect, so here I plotted in log log for you to see that the correlation function without the wiggles, the yellow thing, happens to go through a zero um, at more or less the same scale. So if it's not a power law. If I just took out the, the, the wiggles, the yellow line is not a power law. It's even below the power law, happen right around that scale. Okay, it's dropping, it's going through zero, and it's particularly small, okay? What is, what is this zero? What is the, where is, who is setting the scale for the zero? Is the matter radiation equality, okay? So, again, the fact that the zero, this coincidence, it's all working in your favor in this thing. So matter radiation equality being close to the BAO, then the correlation function in the absence of the wiggles happens to be, would be very small. The wiggles, you have a lot of wiggles, they combine to just one feature, and it happens to land in a place where the correlation function is, happens to be small, and so it's a big, it's a much bigger, uh, anyway, I don't know. Not, nothing deep, but I think it's uh, useful to keep in mind that there are these different scales. There's the zero in the correlation function, the zero of the correlation function, the BAO peak, and they happen to lie close to one another, for some coincidence of the thermal history of our universe. Sir, can I ask a question? Why does there's no negative occurrence in this case? It's not just zero. Um, okay, so um, the correlation function needs to integrate to zero. So um, just, uh, or at least if things uh, are smooth with K, uh, because um, the, the correlation function integrated over the whole thing is the same as the power spectrum at k equals to zero. So, um, so, so the integral is the power spectrum at k equals to zero, and if that's a smooth thing that goes to zero, then, yeah, yeah. So, um, but, 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 but uh, of course, if, but, but in truth, if, if um, that, that minimum is set by matter radiation equality. So if, if you start moving the shape of this is where you, you, you so, um, yeah. So if, if you had, if you say, uh, if, so the first answer that I told you is, uh, is not so nice because uh, had you had a power spectrum that was just a power law and you go to Fourier space, the, or to real space, the correlation function is a power law, okay? At least when, I mean, there's a range of scales for which the thing will converge, but, um, but for those range of ends, I mean. Uh, but for that, for that, then it's a power law will go into a power law, but our universe is not a power law, and, and, and you have there that. Uh, okay, so, um, and so the, the, the other thing to keep in mind is the, um, Another scale that is, uh, so I already mentioned one other scale uh, that I'm not showing now, which was the free streaming of the neutrinos. Remember this plot with the, the, the power spectrum of the neutrinos or, or the effect of the neutrinos on the power spectrum. They did nothing and then they, they, they suppressed power. That scale at which you have this transition is to do with the distance the, the neutrinos can travel, given that... Uh, so that they start with uh, a lot of random motions because they are non-relative, so they are relativistic. So um, it's the free streaming length of the neutrinos. Happens to be around here as well, okay? Um, around this, this scale as well. If you remember, this thing was around K of point something. Um, and, and, and the other thing that we will discuss much more in these lectures is the fact that the place where um, I, you know, this is a uh, redshift dependent uh, question, but when is the overdensity or when are the nonlinear effects becoming large in this structure formation? Um, so this is just an example of uh, at redshift zero, the power spectrum in the nonlinear power spectrum of matter compared, uh, divided by the linear power spectrum without wiggles. So you can see that around this, you know, um, K of, uh, so, so already at this scale, you have a factor of two change between the linear power spectrum and the nonlinear. So somewhere around here, you start making sizable corrections uh, to the so to the linear theory. Okay, again around this k of point something. 
Okay? And of course, where, whether this is a big deal or not depends on the precision that you care things about. But uh, as I was telling you before, a lot of these questions now boil down to sub-percent effects. So if you ask the question, where does the, do the nonlinear effect are percent or sub-percent, you're, you're, you have to go pretty large scales for that to be the case. Okay? Um, um, yeah, this I, I already, I think I already told you. In the correlation function, the place where uh, you can also define the scale at which uh, the correlation function is around one or nonlinearities are large, you just, I mean, now I'm plotting again the uh, correlation function in log log so you can see where you cross one, okay? So, so, but good thing, again, now I already told you about this coincidence, but the other very good thing is that this BAO scale sits very far away from this nonlinear, or you know, quite far away from this nonlinear scale, the the amplitude here is rather small, okay, of the correlation function. So, if the nonlinear effects were just to do with the with the delta, the hundred megaparsecs, they would be small corrections, okay. Um, okay, so let me let me uh, spend the last half an hour. Um, discussing uh, some of these exact resu results, things that we know. So before we try to do some uh, perturbation theory or whatever, so I, I tried to convince you that some of these questions uh, require um, you know, very precise things, to know, know things very precisely. Um, so um, there are certain statements that one can make about the, um, about the, the, the structure formation process that um, are exact in some sense, okay? So, and those are useful because, uh, you know, imagine you're trying to really make a, let's be realistic here. Imagine you're trying to make a measurement at 10 to minus three level, okay? Do you, if this is going to depend on some feedback and explosion of supernovae and how much and the dust, it's never gonna happen, okay? Um, I think, I mean, I, or I will not see it. Uh, so, so it's good if there are certain things, or if I really need to demand that the simulations are accurate to a 10 to minus 3, I don't know if it will ever happen because the simulations are trying to model these very complicated things in any case. And so, I mean, then they're not done from first principles. So I think I will not say it's hopeless because I have some friends that I don't want to say that to. But it's difficult, very difficult. So if there are things that we can know exactly, it's better, okay? So let's see, what are the things that we can know exactly? So there, there, are, many th there are several things that we can know exactly, so that we know exactly. So let me, let me just ask, uh, let, let me just, uh, you know, go through some of them, okay? Unfortunately, there are, not so, there are several things that we know, but not, we don't know everything. It would be great if we, if we can compute everything, or everything that we cared about. Uh, boiled down to um, something uh, that we know for sure. Uh, but it might be the case that anything that we will learn anything about is rela any, you know, better than the CMB has to be related to some of the things that we can know for sure, okay? This is, po this is a potential theorem, but I don't know. Hopefully it's not true, but... Uh, uh, okay, so an example, okay, one, one, uh, one, one example is, uh, I think you, you already discussed with David uh, how galaxies trace uh, dark matter or trace the matter density, and you wrote things like uh, delta galaxy uh, equals B times delta, okay, or equivalently as I wrote it there, some B times the Laplacian of phi, okay. Why didn't you write b times phi, question mark? Why didn't you write b times phi or whatever? I mean, why was there, why did you think that this, was, okay, we can have some more, blah, 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 but let me ask differently. Without talking about, um, without talking about um, halo occupation distribution or press check or whatever, without, is there some reason why we wouldn't write this, okay? And there is some reason. Anybody? Number of galaxies, yeah? Yeah, the equivalence principle, right? So the gravitational potential is not something that's locally observable, okay? So we wouldn't say that there's more galaxies. So is the Laplacian of the gravity, the tides, this, yes, can affect whether a galaxy forms or not. 
So this, no problem, makes, makes a lot of sense. This doesn't make much sense, okay? So we don't need to write it, we don't write it. Or equivalently, if we were to find some sort of physical effect that if in fact looked like something like this in the data, it's not something that we can mock around by feedback and supernovae and dust, okay? The equivalence principle will not allow for astrophysics to make the galaxy number density or whatever it is, doesn't matter, galaxy, whatever complicated story you're measuring cannot depend on phi like this, okay? Unless you violate the equivalence principle, okay? So I will not do that in these lectures or in my life, as I was saying before. No, but uh, no, we shouldn't, okay. Th then you would learn something about violation of the equivalence principle, but let's assume you're not doing that. So you would never, and one example of some physical process that, uh, that in the data looks like this is this uh, non-Gaussianities that we will discuss later. So it makes it look like, uh, the, or it makes it such that the number density of tracers is proportional or depends on the gravitational potential as opposed to k square phi. But that's not something that is produced um, cannot be produced by astrophysics, is not produced in the late universe, is something about the initial conditions. You manage to create something that in the initial conditions makes it look like things are sensitive to phi, and we can discuss how you do it. You're not, without violating the equivalence principle, because anyway. Uh, but so at least this is some sort of robust thing. If you measure something like that, you know it, you cannot biasing stuff, it's not gonna help, okay? So that's one example of something that is like this. Um, okay, so then th th there are other, uh, other examples, uh, similar examples, and uh, um, you know, there are people in, in, the, in the audience and here that, uh, that have worked on this much more than I have, so, um, but let, let, um, so, so, Probably you should uh, discuss with them, but let, let, me, let me summarize some of these uh, results. There are these so-called uh, um, consistency conditions of large-scale structure, and, uh, and they boil down again to this uh, equivalence principle. I think this, when I say things that we know for sure, it always boils down to something related to the equivalence principle, okay? And uh, the, 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 the statement is the following. So there are certain relations between endpoint functions. So here is some endpoint functions. Uh, so I'm quoting from a paper by these people. But, um, so, um, so these are endpoint functions. This G means galaxies, but it's supposed to encode anything complicated. So endpoint function that could include things complicated by which you mean I have no idea to compute. Even if I have no idea how to compute, just as I know that this cannot be the case, I know that uh, there are certain relations between endpoint functions of these things that I don't know how to compute. And you know, this is, say, a, 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 some relation between some endpoint function and some lower, so lower order. And so, let, so for example, a particular example would be here a three-point function, a relation between a three-point function and two-point functions, OK? So even though I don't know how to compute this in detail, um, then I know that whatever they are, whatever the simulation is doing, needs to uh, satisfy such a relation, okay? And where is this relation coming from? So uh, first of all, uh, um, so, so the, 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 wh where it's coming from, again, is from the equivalence principle, the, 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 um, um, the, the, the story. And, and this relation, sorry, I, I should have said, only applies when, so these are, there's a bunch of momenta of wave vectors, K1, K2, Kn, okay? And there's another one, Q. It, it, it only works, it's a relation which is true in the so-called squeeze limit in which the Q wave vector is much smaller than the K wave. So Q is in the limit Q much, much smaller than K, okay? So in that limit, the endpoint functions need to satisfy various relations. Where are they coming from? Well, they are coming basically from the equivalence principle. So if we are discussing this situation, you are trying to ask the question, what would be the effect of a very long wavelength mode Q, very long, on some small scale stuff, okay? So, um, and similar, it's similar to this statement, right, that 
what is this, we are always discussing what's happening on large scales. What is the effect of some long mode on, uh, on, um, on, uh, on the formation of galaxies, say, which is the, in this case the, the small scale thing? Uh, in that case, the, the small scale thing is the clustering or the endpoint functions of galaxies. But, so some small scale property. Here I told you, OK, it cannot depend on, uh, so let me change the, so it cannot depend on the potential phi of Q, how much galaxies, uh, how much galaxies you form. It should depend on the Laplacian of phi of Q. But if you're a little bit careful for some questions, it could depend on just, uh, on just the gradient, just one derivative. But not really, because you know that it, it needs to, so, okay, so let's be a little bit careful. So, so you have this long wavelength mode. What, so this is a very long wavelength mode. You have some small uh, things here. What, what will they do? What will the long wavelength mode do? Well, it will move these two things by some amount, okay? So, I'm, I'm sh so the, the gradient of phi will just uh, move these two things uh, by, by, by some amount. If, uh, if uh, the, the, but if I'm going to observe this um, at, at a fixed time here, in order for me to see something, they need to either you know, separate or get closer or something like that, which will only occur if the mode that I'm discussing is shorter. If it's a long mode, much longer than this separation, then the two things will move together. Okay, and so I can go to the log to the frame where I'm moving with this uh, the motion produced by the long mode. I should see nothing. Okay, so if I make a measurement at a fixed time, then I should see nothing. Okay. However, th how much they move between two times, if I'm able to see how much things move between two times, then yes, I should see that motion. Okay. So in other words, if I'm able to measure the certain part of these effects of the long mode that can depend on just the, the overall motion that is given by the gradient of phi, but I can only see it, I should only be able to see it if I wait and I see where things are now and where they move. Because the, if I just go to the frame and just look locally without comparing two times or something like this, I shouldn't be able to see anything, okay? And so, the, if, if you notice these um, um, consistency conditions, so you can see that uh, this correlation function is evaluated at, so you're measuring this uh, endpoint function of, uh, of these uh, mysterious Gs at various times, eta 1, eta n, and you can see it depends on, uh, on, uh, on the growth factor at the various time. In the particular case in which all of, the, all of the times are the same, this D factor comes out of the sum. Now the sum of all the Ks is zero by momentum conservation, and so you don't get anything from here. Okay. So these are only non-trivial things um, if you can measure things at two different, uh, two different times. But however, I mean, just uh, in, in any case, there are these. So for observations, it would appear that we never are able to do this, right? So we are never, um, we are never able to measure things at two separate times. And so this looks like a little bit hopeless. But... Um, but in any case, there are these relations that are, that are, um, that are universal, and they don't depend on what we're I mean, They're just coming from the equivalence principle, OK? Um, so I think um, Merdad uh, Mirbabaye will be giving a, a talk on, on, on this, uh, on, on what I was going to talk uh, next in, on Monday by f for 15 minutes. So let, let me just uh, uh, say it very quickly. Um, and uh, so it would appear, as I've just uh, told you this story, it would appear as if, um, so I think the, the moral of this story is that there are certain terms that if, if, there's, if, if there's, there are certain terms that are fixed on you by the equivalence principle, how things move and stuff like this. Those, they cannot depend on details, uh, on details of how, what are you talking about, okay? It needs to, they are universal terms, okay? So in this example, it looks like um, it looks like um, you can only um, you can only um, see this if you observe things at uh, at um, at two different times. The way I told you, so it looks like it's not particularly uh, interesting. However, um, 
these terms also are very important for something that we have already observed, um, and so, um, which is the smoothing of the BAO peak. How does this work? So now, imagine I'm considering um, modes that are now smaller than the separation between these two points. Now, these two points, um, the motions of these two points, then now we'll bring them together or further apart, okay? So these, these motions, these grad phi motions can move them together and apart. If I, knew, if I know at what distance they started with, even if I observe these two points at one single time, I can know whether they are closer or further away than where they were to start with, if somebody told me where they were to start with. But the BAO is such an example. There's a narrow feature in the correlation function that tells you that at least statistically there is an over density of things at a very specific scale. So these terms that induce relative motions, these terms that are fixed on you by the equivalence principle, they um, um, in induce relative motions. They are universal. They have to be there. You have no choice. And because you know how things were at the beginning, you can see that they change this separation and this screw up the BAO peak, and they, in fact, are the terms that smooth the BAO peak, okay? So the terms in the, or, or the physical effect that, um, that smooths the BAO peak is just, the same, is just the same terms that are fixed on you by the equivalence principle, and that's the reason why, uh, um, well, anyway, so, 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 so they're fixed on you by the equivalence principle, and, uh, and they have a very important, uh, and they have a very important effect. And so I leave it to him to explain in detail how you can see this happening. Um, and uh, so let me, let me, um, so let me, um, so um, just just tell you the, the bottom line. So um, so, and, and this has already been uh, very much observed. Okay, so. So, but the only point that uh, I, I want to um, connect uh, for you to listen to his talk and connect is the fact that this smoothing of the BAO peak is coming precisely from these terms, or you will see that it's coming precisely from these terms that are fixed on you by the equivalence principle. And as uh, David was showing you before, the linear theory correlation function that I showed at the beginning had a very narrow peak, and uh, the, the, the thing uh, that you at late times, it's, uh, it has broadened out, but it's, it's all coming from, from, these, uh, from these motions that, that uh, are very much a universal thing that you don't have any, any freedom. They don't depend on biasing. They don't depend on any of these things. Um, so I think, yeah, let, 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 I, I, I leave him to, to, um, to um, explain. Um, this, this, this to you um, in, in the, the algebra, the, in detail. I mean, it, it will be in the, in the transparency. I will, I will try to put all these transparencies and some mathematical file in the, on some internet, uh, on some internet, <laughs> uh, on, on the Twitter. I mean. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so yes, uh, I will do that. And, uh, but uh, let me just uh, comment on the following thing. So, I was telling you before that, um, that uh, oh, it's great that, um, that the BAO scale is so separated from the um, nonlinear scale, from the place where the non you would think places where the nonlinearities are order one, so delta of order one, that's where you create very big things. The correlation function is very small by the time you get to the BAO scale, so you would think any effect on the BAO to do with nonlinearities will be related to delta uh, on these scales, and then it would be a very small effect. But however, if you just look, uh, we already show you here, I mean, this moving of the BAO peak is a dramatic thing. It's not a tenth of a percent thing or a 0.2 percent effect or whatever. It's a big thing, okay? So this must mean that uh, not all the effects um, not all the effects, not all of the nonlinear effects have to do with delta. They must have to do with something else, because if not, they couldn't possibly be so big. And in fact, um, yeah, they have to do with something else. In fact, they, some of these terms have to do with these motions. And they are enhanced, those terms are enhanced 
by, uh, by, in this particular case, by the width, the ratio of the width of the BAO peak to the separation of, uh, of uh, to the 100 megaparsec, the 10 megaparsec width to the 100 megaparsec separation. So those nonlinear terms are enhanced by that, and uh, they depend on this relative motion, and this is why they, they are pretty substantial. But it's then ver a very good thing that this, uh, these nonlinear effects are universal. They are fixed on you by the equivalence principle, so there's no room for discussion. So they are what they are, and uh, you can compute them. Uh, and, uh, but uh, um, the, let, me, let me just show you the w one other um, plot uh, that then I will connect in the, in the next lectures, which is the following. So, um, so, um, Okay, so this uh, smoothing of the BAO peak, so this is the linear theory, uh, the linear theory power spectrum, okay? And this is the, the, the nonlinear, at redshift zero, the correlation function, sorry, the correlation function, and at, at, at redshift zero, so and you can see this big smoothing. So uh, one puzzle or one thing that we will discuss uh, much more is why is it th that this can be such a large effect even though delta on a 100 megaparsec scale is very small? So there are these additional terms that, that are doing order one smoothing of the thing, a big effect. And this just, uh, the, the flip side to these ver very big terms somewhere floating around even though you're at 100 megaparsecs is that if you just take standard perturbation theory that we will discuss to compute um, corrections, expanding things at powers of delta. You might say, I'm at 100 megaparsec. It should be linear theory, OK? OK, I don't know. I'm seeing something. OK, let me just do one order more, OK? Just to make sure do something, OK? If you do that something, just then you get the dashed blue curve. So it's a complete disaster, OK? So clearly. Um, there's something you have to be careful about. Um, is uh, naively so, and, and the, the whole point is that there are these uh, effects that are big. So just adding one more is not enough. It's just you need to add many of many of these terms or sum them up in some way. And it, it's very so. So it's very handy that we know um, this particular set of terms that are giving the smoothing of the BAO peak. We know them all because they are fixed by the equivalence principle. They are, in fact, I think David already told you that this Aldovich approximation, which is this linear theory in Lagrangian space, gets the correlation function pretty good, uh, almost on top of the actual. Um, so wh while, while this is the first nonlinear, this is the, f the, the correlation function in the first nonlinear correction of the, if you solve the equations in Eulerian perturbation theory. So you had linear perturbation theory. I told you about uh, delta, blah, 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 in Eulerian. Then we will do, uh, we will do, we will do, try to do better approximations, so on. So the blue is the linear perturbation theory in Eulerian. The dashed is the first non-trivial correction, the first non-linear correction you will get in Eulerian perturbation theory. And it's, you know, very bad. It's just as bad as linear theory compared to the actual answer, okay? However, in the, um, if you do Lagrangian perturbation theory in the linear order, which is just this Seldovich approximation, the, 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 date, the, the curve, I didn't show it. I'm sorry, I will add it later. It will just go through the points, okay? So somehow, these two ways of doing are not the same. And in fact, it's all about these terms that are fixed on you by the equivalence principle and the Eulerian. You're, in the Lagrangian, you're keeping them all. And you know what they are. They are the correct ones. Um, and that's why it works. So, I, but we will discuss this in more detail. But I think um, it's, um, um, and it ties to this reconstruction and so on. So it's true that, uh, that um, um, you know, these nonlinear effects um, are very, well, they are under control, but if you are not particularly careful about it, it looks like a disaster, okay? But, I mean, people have known, I mean, this is old stories, but it's just uh, so... Uh, um, okay, so um, I have five minutes left, so um, let me just uh, so summarize this and leave you with two exercises. So, um, so there are then these... Um, there are some uh, um, exact... Uh, 
relations uh, to, related to endpoint functions, for example, uh, and always things to do with the equivalence principle that we know about even without needing to solve uh, the equations very much. Um, and so th those are useful, and they will be useful, for example, at the time of discussing non-Gaussianities. Um, and then there are, um, there are other um, results that, that you can, and I'll, I'll leave you with two in, uh, exercises that I will put in the notes uh, for you to do. So two, two exact results. So for example, well, one exact result and one some approximation that we will use. Uh, so this is just an, uh, an exercise, so I will not derive anything. But so consider the case of omega matter equals to one universe with power law initial conditions. So the power spectrum is, um, is um, uh, just a power law. You will see that there is some symmetry in these equations and in the initial conditions that allow you to rescale. If you have a solution, you can rescale to find another solution. And as long as you rescale the x coordinate and the time coordinates in some specific way by some uh, re factors that are related in this way, um, you get to a new solution. And so this is a symmetry of uh, a new solution that had the same initial uh, power spectrum. And that's equivalently another way of showing that uh, if in this kind of situation, whatever you, the, the kqp of k that you compute needs to be just a function of the scale over the nonlinear scale at the given redshift. So as time goes by, the, in these examples, uh, um, k nonlinear will change with time. But what you will see, say, in the result of a simulation or in your analytical calculation, it better be just a universal function that might depend on the slope of, or that will depend on the slope of the initial conditions, but just a function of k over k nonlinear. So it be better be that the, the scale and time dependence, just because you're in, there's no, you're in Einstein the theater power law, there's no other scale, it should be like that. So you should prove this as an exercise. And then another useful, uh, this one is not a real profound thingy, but, or, a, uh, or any kind of exact result, but some, uh, some uh, um, uh, another thing to notice is you, I was uh, finding for you solutions, or we will try to find solutions of these equations, uh, Newton's law and so on. And let's use as the time, instead of using the tau, let's use the, as a time the log of the growth factor. So you just use that as a time and you make the change of coordinates. You will discover that you end up with the following set of equations. Laplacian of some phi tilde equals to delta. And the equation of S for S is just this as a function of uh, the only place, other place where there's any cosmology. So there's some cosmology on what D is. And the only other place when there is any cosmology is in this omega matter over f square factor that appears in both places. But it happens to be the case that even uh, for all the cosmologies that we are interested in, omega matter over f square is very close to 1 anyway. It doesn't change very much with the cosmology. So the main dependence of the cosmology is just, um, is just uh, um, in the growth factor. Okay, So if... Uh, so to the extent that you forget about this small difference, all that you need to do if you want to change cosmology is change. You have solved the problem for one cosmology. The other cosmology is the same, but you just need to rescale the growth factor, OK? Wherever the, the growth factor appeared in your equations. Uh, and we will use this. But so I leave also for you as an exercise to show that when you use as time the growth factor, then the equations, I mean, the only, other, the only other combination of cosmological parameters that appear, this is the full equation that an n-body simulation will solve, OK? So even for an n-body simulation, it should satisfy this. I mean, to the extent you drop this, then everything should be in the growth factor. So, um, so OK, I'll, I'll, I'll leave those two things for you to, to prove. OK.